The next will be a panel discussion on tax, transparency and self-insurance. The only constant is change. This will be moderated by Benjamin Tausig, the tax partner, Financial Services, Deloitte, Southeast Asia. Ben is a financial service tax partner with Deloitte in Singapore and lead Deloitte's insurance tax practice in Southeast Asia with a wider focus on Asia Pacific. Ben has more than 15 years of experience in tax advice, mainly to insurance group. Recently relocated from London, Ben specialises in insurance and taxation surrounding it. Joining him in the panel will be Sean Welch, Head of Captive Management and Business Development, APAC Zurich Insurance, and Annie Undikai, Managing Director, Brighton Management. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator and the panellists to the stage. Thank you, everyone. Um, my uh, panellists decided that they would uh, sit in the audience and feverishly take some notes because um, this session is going to be a little bit different from some of the other ones in that um, we're going to just run through the constant change part at the beginning. Um, there was a paper that came out um, a little over a couple of weeks ago from the OECD on um, transfer pricing and in particular on captives. So we're going to have a look at that. But before we get into that, I thought it would be useful to set the scene with a polling question. So um, if we could have the polling question, please. Um, so what we wanted to understand is, do you understand the relevance so of, of BEPS for captives? And I'm not going to say what BEPS is, so hopefully that um, we won't have anybody answering C but we shall see. All right, so as that ticks up, it, it's how I think I'm going to have to explain what is BEPS. Um, <laughs> so BEPS stands for Behis Erosion and Profit Shifting. Um, and that is a international tax development that has come in over the last five, six years. Um, what happens... Um, post the financial crisis, a lot of governments were starting to um, run short on tax collection compared to where they used to be. Um, you had large, some of the large banks no longer actually paying any tax. They made lots of losses, etc. And so tax takes went down. At the same time, the press got hold of the fact that certain organizations never paid any tax. In particular, in the UK, people picked up on the fact that Starbucks didn't pay any tax in the UK. Uh, similarly, Google wasn't paying very much tax in the UK. And if you live in London, you'll know quite how many Starbucks coffee shops there are in London. So Starbucks, loads and loads of coffee shops in London, but it's not paying any tax on its profits. Um, and so part of that response to all of this is, is BEP. So the OECD came together um, with, thanks to the G20. Um, and they, came, they were tasked with coming up with new rules for, tax, for the tax system, the global tax system, to stop people base eroding and profit shifting. So base eroding is when you take lots, you, you have a subsidiary in a jurisdiction, and you put in interest expense or other similar types of um, expenses, and you erode the tax base. So there's no tax left to pay. Profit shifting is where you just move profits through the likes of royalties or through the likes of being able to set up in a jurisdiction where you don't have to have too much substance. So why is that relevant to captives? So part of the BEPS project looked at um, types of businesses where you didn't need very many people and you just had to have capital in a jurisdiction. And they said, well, captive insurance is part of that. And a lot of tax jurisdictions have historically not liked captives. So the US has significant rules stopping captives or designed to prevent captives. Actually, when we talked about captive failure earlier on today, some of that was driven by the US tax rules requiring third-party business to be in captives. So US groups, did not understanding insurance, got their third party business to come in so that they could get the tax benefits of having a captive. And unfortunately, because tax was wagging the dog's tail, the captive failed. So we have seen um, tax jurisdictions cut, 
um, sort of crack down on captives over a number of years. So the UK has, the US has, Australia has, the Dutch have, and guess what? All of those tax authorities came together and pulled all of that um, knowledge and all of their different ways to attack captives together, and part of all of that is in this paper that came out on the 3rd of July. So what this paper seeks to do is to say, how should you properly remunerate a captive? Because a captive is dealing with related parties. It's dealing with related parties. How do you remunerate it? Because the related parties can set what the remuneration should be for the captive. That's the theory of, ta of the tax authorities. The document also dealt with other aspects of financial transactions. So it deals with treasury functions, it deals with intercompany loans, etc. It's taken two years to come out. It's non-consensus because all the tax authorities can agree. However, we've seen quite a lot of consensus around the captive part. So we had a conversation with one of the people who was charged of writing the, this paper, and he said, look, there was much more consensus around captives. So this is the direction of travel we're going in. Um, like I said, it's divided into four main sections. The bit we're going to concentrate on is captives. So the, the paper starts with a conversation around what is insurance. And the whole idea behind this is to say, hey, there has to be proper insurance for the captive to be rewarded. So then it talks about what are the types of things that mean it's insurance. So diversification and pooling of risks. Improvement of the economic capital of the group as a result of the diversification. Um, an evidence of an external insurance market. Um, possibility of losses and requisite skills in the insurer. Those are the types of things it's talking about. Some of those are quite easy for a captive to demonstrate. So possibility of losses. Okay, A captive, I mean, it would be amazing if your captive only was profitable. I don't think that's going to be the case. It's going to make losses every so often. Um, evidence of an external insurance market for the covered risks. That starts becoming trickier. That might be one of the reasons why you have a captive, because actually part of the risk is risk you can't lay off. We heard about that earlier on today um, in the first session, talking about the ability to lay off additional risks as a result of having a captive. Um, requisite, requisite skills. Okay. Do I, does everybody's captive actually have the requisite skills? Probably not today. So this is a question around... Do you need more substance? Do you need Mr. Substance, as Richard referred to earlier? So are we going to see the, the, the sort of the EU captive with Mr. Substance becoming the standard? The bit where it gets a little trickier is around the diversification and pooling of risks and the improvement of the economic capital. The tax authority's starting point, if you read through the paper, is that's not possible in a captive. <laughs> okay. They ask a question in the paper where it starts to say, is it possible to do that? Um, it is. I mean, you are diversifying the risks within your group as a result of entering into the captive because you're pooling more risk together in one particular place and then you're laying, potentially laying it off. That's potentially, that's potentially improving the economic capital of the group. Um, and you are, there is a presence of diversification and there is a polling of risk. Yes, it's within the same organization, but you've got de different legal em entities within your group, and those legal entities have their own risks. They have their own boards. You're dealing, I, I know some groups where they say, my subsidiary company won't accept this intercompany charge because the board won't. Yes, it's a subsidiary of the group, but it still has its board. The paper talks about some of the commercial reasons for establishing a captive, which is good. Um, pretty well thought out. 
Um, and it does talk about the potential to ensure against certain risks that are difficult or impossible to send coverage for in the market. It then says, uh, is that really commercially rational? How do you price it? And that's come from a Dutch tax case. Okay? So that's with a Dutch influence coming in there. There was a Dutch tax case that dealt with this issue. And sort of the, 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 the view was that it is possible in certain circumstances, and it still is insurance. Just because there is an external market for it doesn't mean it's insurance. It's not insurance. So I think we're OK there. Um, one thing to point out that's really important here is in the draft, it, it deals with the issue of fronting. So it deals with the issue that um, you have an insurer, Zurich, because Sean's my, uh, my panelist on this one. So you've got your insurer, you've got, you got Zurich or Excel Catlin for, for the Excel Catlin guys here. You've got, you've got your insurer that's interposed, and then you have a reinsurance captive. It says the transaction between the insurer, so Zurich or Excel, not a member of your group, and the reinsurer captive, which is a member of your group, that is what they call a controlled transaction. That is a related party transaction because you are taking a transaction from actually really the underlying part of that transaction is from you, your group company. You just can't write that business directly. You don't have a license. You pay a fronting fee. But actually, what's the economic substance? It is a transaction between two controlled parties. So that is subject to transfer pricing. A lot of people haven't really thought it was. And they've tried to argue that it wasn't. So this is bad news for those who have been doing that. Now, one of the things that we're seeing far more of in this market, in the tax world, and in transfer pricing, is recharacterization. So from a tax authority's perspective, what's easier and what gets them more money? Is it arguing over how much of a margin should be charged on an expense? Okay, is in, a, in, a, in the good old days, you used to be able to say, hey, look, we've got an intercompany service. We'll just do cost plus 5%. Tax authorities might say, oh, it's a bit high. Can you make it cost plus 3 or something along those lines? Or it, that, now they've wised up and said, hey, you know what? Let's recharacterize this and say, there's no benefit here, or this isn't insurance, or this shouldn't be, this isn't a valid expense. Because instead of arguing over, like, let's take, take a fiction example, the cost, the cost, the charge is 100, and arguing over the margin, the 3% or the 5%, they'll just disallow the 100. Uh, increase, increase the amount of tax by 100 instead of increasing the amount of tax by 2. So. This paper thinks about what is actually, when do you actually start to recharacterize this? And the whole sort of thrust of the BEPS agenda around recharacterization is ensuring that the, the party that is assuming the risk, so the captive, we assume insurance risk, it has sufficient functionality to be able to control that risk and understand the risk it is assuming. Okay? So, is it insurance? That was a bit of, they talked about at the beginning, is there risk diversification or all those things? And are you able to properly control that risk? The paper doesn't talk about being able to control that risk. It says, can you help me come up with some ideas on this? Okay? So they talk about two things. They talk about the financial capacity to assume risk and pay claims. Is your captive appropriately capitalized? So in an RBC world, yes. Okay? In a sort of simple solvency one type world where it's just a percentage of premium or it's a nominal amount? Maybe. Okay? Um, the financial capacity to pay claims, that's all taken from some of the Australian law around this. 
It's all saying, look, actually, is this a real insurance company? Can you pay claims? Generally, the answer should be yes. The second point around risk diversification, that was a point I alluded to earlier where they say, actually, is there proper risk diversification in a multinational group? Because you're only taking risks from the group, brothers, sisters, and companies. The US tax court has found on a number of occasions that that does constitute insurance and there is risk diversification. So I think we're okay there. The, the, the bigger issue is what is like sort of means that you have the functionality to assume those risks. So I think that's going to come down to the question of outsourcing versus insourcing. Okay? So co-sourcing, what are the types of models? So the old model of having your insurance manager in country X, say take the example of an Australian group, you got your insurance manager in Australia, you've got your captive in Lab One, for example. That Lab One captive has one office clerk who sits in the office and answers the calls, um, answers the phone. Um, they have a um, manager who's based in Lab One who does some of the captive management. And then you have some people in KL that help as well. But actually all the hearts and minds of that whole business and whole thinking about the captive and what risk goes into the captive, how does it operate, etc. That person sat in Australia. And then you've got a board of the captive who's delegated certain responsibilities to that individual in Australia. That captive doesn't really have substance in Lab One. Okay? It's got some substance. It's got a board. It's got somebody who's got delegated authority that provides a service to it. It's got an outsourcing arrangement. It's capable of paying claims. It's a proper company. It's got all of the right committees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't have substance in that jurisdiction. And that is what this paper is getting to. They don't want to say what is allowed in the paper and give examples. Okay? They don't want to say you need one person. They don't want to say you need two people. Because one size doesn't fit all. Okay, so we're, we try, we're talking to industry, we're feeding back, we're having, we're having discussions to try and say, okay, let's give indications of how in practice people manage the assumption of insurance risk and ways in which it can be practical. Because you've got the regulatory regime that's set out by Solvency II and other jurisdictions, and you, you don't want to have a separate regime that applies for tax. You want to have something that makes sense on a global basis that you can use that actually everybody understands and that is appropriate given the nature of the business that you're writing. So that's the bit around recharacterization. Then there's a the bit around pricing of premiums. Again, this, some of this stuff has come from a Dutch case. Some of it stuff has come from a UK um, case. And what they're talking about, and I think this is quite challenging, is talking about the fact that, look, you can't compare a captive to a commercial insurer. Okay? You just can't. The return on capital of an external reinsurer or insurer is very different from the return on capital of a captive. The nature of the, the claims, the claims profile is different. The type of businesses they write is different. The regulatory concerns is different. The rating agency concerns are different, et cetera, et cetera. There are some captives that need a rating. There are a lot of captives that don't need a rating. You have different pressures. But what they're trying to say is, hey, can we look at it by saying, let's take a combined ratio that we think is appropriate and an investment return based on capital. But they then say, well, actually, a lot of captives are overcapitalized. So is the investment return, what's the level of capital that, that a captive needs? Okay? And then they say, well, because you can't compare it to an insurer because insurers are required to have a rating and they might need more capital or an insurer has got issues around returning capital to shareholders, all of these types of things. So they get themselves in a bit of a, in a, bit of a bind here about what is the appropriate way to do it. Um, the, the, the concern here is, actually, there probably isn't a one-size-fits-all right answer to this. Um, I think you're going to end up in a situation where 
some form of actuarial analysis is required to appropriately price the premiums or some form of sort of review of the risk, et cetera. Try and benchmark, it's quite hard, but some form of actuarial analysis um, that makes it reasonable. And then the, the investment return piece is going to be potentially challenging. But you, again, you're going back to the point that the, the, the captive does need a certain amount of capital to ensure it's able to pay claims. So they accept that you need a certain amount of capital to, in order to pay claims, but then they say people stuff too much capital in the captive. So there's that tension, okay? So we, I think as the industry, we just need to educate the authorities around what is an appropriate level of capital. They then sort of raise two very specific scenarios. One is a, is, is a piece around saying, hey, look, a captive actually is a bit like a procurement function, okay? And actually what you have here is you have a pooling of risk and then there's certain benefits that you get from pooling the risk, the group synergy, and that should be shared with the participants that are pooling that risk. So in the same way that if you think about it in a procurement function, um, if you have a group procurement company that actually pulls the, the purchasing power of your group together and means that you can only, that you, it sort of bashes down suppliers so that you get the cheapest rates. I face that all the time in my business that I have sort of battling with procurement, pushing our rates down, et cetera. They say that that, similar to a captive, and therefore those benefits should be shared with the participants. How you measure that group synergy and how, you, how much you say that group synergy is related to actually the functionality of the captive and how much of that is related just to the sheer pooling of risk and therefore should be passed back is challenging. Because actually, again, goes back to the comment that if you have a proper captive that is actually looking at your risk and acting as a profit center, um, then if it's acting as a profit center, it should be rewarded for acting as a profit center and it's got staff, it's got people there, it's actually operating like a proper insurer and it's um, doing services for the group. It should be rewarded for that. Um, the second point derives from a tax case in the UK um, one of the very few transfer pricing cases that's ever been litigated in the UK, um, the Dixon's case. Okay, so Dixon's, what happened was Dixon's was a big electrical retailer in the UK. Um, and what Dixon's did was they set up an insurance company in Guernsey. That insurance company in Guernsey, it provided external warranties. Okay, to all of the electronics that Dixon's sold. So it's provided external warranties to customers. The, um, the insurance company, that insurance company was highly profitable. External warranty, as an extended warranty business is generally quite profitable. Um, at least it used to be. So this extended warranty business, really profitable, sat in Guernsey, not subject to UK tax. Tax man not happy. The tax man came in and said, actually, you know what's happening here? That commission level, that you're paying the UK sales force is not high enough, okay? You as a captive, your sole customer is actually Dixon's, okay? The only person you're doing business with is Dixon's. Dixon's are providing you, ac providing you with access to a distribution channel that you would not otherwise have access to. You would not be able to write any business if it wasn't for that ac access to that distribution channel, therefore they should be rewarded for access to that distribution channel. And the amount of the, you're paying them to access that distribution channel is not enough because you should not be keeping 90% of the profit and they only get 10. Actually, they've got all the bargaining power because you know what they could do? The UK group could go to AIG and say, hey, AIG, do you want to write this business? And AIG would say, yeah, that's great, really profitable business and we'll pay you a big commission. So they were successful in arguing that, the tax authorities, and this is what this is picking up. So this is saying, hey, look, if you're writing highly profitable insurance because of access to a distribution channel that you would not, already, you would not otherwise have, you need to reward that distribution channel. So that's the sort of 
um, summary behind the paper. Um, comments are due at the end of September. Um, I think there's going to be a, there's a number of comments that are coming through that we that we're getting from some of the um, captive managers and brokers. Um, Anybody else who wants to feed in some comments, has got thoughts on it, very welcome to sort of pick those up offline, um, have further conversations with people. We want to make sure that the views of industry are reflected in the representations. Um, but I thought what we would now do is just um, switch to another polling question. Um, and then as, the, as you, you guys are voting, um, if I can ask my panelists to come up, we'll have a bit of a discussion around this as well. Please. Okay. Sort of as we wait for people to start responding to the to the polling question, I can see that sort of slowly but surely people are waking up after being uh, sort of uh, bombarded with tax for the last twenty five minutes. Um, I thought it would be sort of helpful just to talk about what are, what are you guys seeing in practice? Because um, I'm sitting here as the, the tax advisor, um, but it's interesting to understand what are people, and saying what people should be doing, but it's interesting to hear about what people are doing. So I guess um, the first question I have is around, um, are you seeing sort of increased levels of substance, are you seeing people start to actually have real substance in their captive as opposed to previously outsourcing the majority of the business? So, I don't know who wants to take it first, Annie. I mean, I can start on that one. Um, there's, there's a, I would say, for some captives, a slow move to actually do that, um, partially also because uh, some jurisdictions in Asia are now actually asking for it. So they are already implementing this. They're trying to be ahead of the curve when it comes to the uh, to BEPS. Um, on the other hand, uh, for some other countries, it actually creates more question around how they can, um, more on the diversification side, and actually create substance beyond, uh, not so much the, the person, um, or the, the individuals that should work there, but more actually the business itself. Okay. Um, in Lab 1, we are not really required to have substance yet for the captive. However, for Brighton, in anticipation for by BEBS, Brighton has actually created a um, service office for our captive to, to rent and have substance. And currently, I think two of our captive have um, rented rooms. Okay. So, yeah, it, we are seeing movement towards that. Great. And I think sort of um, the, the, the topic that's come up has been the, the one that concerns people most is substance and governance requirements, which isn't sort of a surprise. Um, go, going to that, I think sort of um, do you see that changing the value proposition for captives, or do you see it actually as a way of enhancing the value of a captive? Um, honestly, I see it as a value-enhancing situation more. It's not a oh, all bad news story, but actually more of a good news story because it gives. Uh, while there's still a, lo a lot of open questions, and I think there needs to be sufficient feedback. Um, but overall, it stimulates companies looking at their captive differently and actually trying to enhance um, the captive as a risk-bearing vehicle as well uh, as, well as um, again, driving more of a profit center type approach, kind of trying to get that commercial insurance um, attitude in there. Okay. Yeah, I think he says it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I guess the sort of the other, the, the, one of the things I, I, I've been picking out through some of the conversation is it's not just simply the BEPS changes themselves and what we're seeing coming in from the OECD, but it's a wider implementation process. So have you seen any other 
sort of jurisdictions, not so much around the captive jurisdiction themselves, but the parent jurisdictions. Have you seen sort of some of those changes at the parent company level, the group level, influence some of the conversations you've had with potentially prospective new captives um, or with sort of existing players? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. Yeah, most parent company domicile, uh, the, the requirement has increased. So basically the compliance on BEPS, tax reforms, um, that, so that requirement affect their requirement for the domicile, captive okay. domicile. Yeah, same here. Um, actually, the, the different implementation, and uh, one of the interesting ones is, uh, uh, that I tend to mention is Japan, with the, the change in the CFC rules that kind of um, created a, uh, an impetus to change how captives are used and move along more in the direction of what we've seen with Europe and the US, uh, as well as Australia, and um, thus create a, a different structure, a different form of um, creating income. Okay, great. And I, I sort of, one of the things I've been talking to clients around is sort of the increased amount of documentation that's required. Are you seeing that come through as, as additional requests? And, and what type of requests have you seen? Honestly, on my side, sorry, I'm jumping in. <laughs> um, I, I haven't seen more requests in terms of documentation per se. Um, there is more question around uh, how do you measure certain things, especially when it comes to the arm's length pricing, um, transfer pricing considerations, uh, because as you mentioned earlier, uh, some companies, when it comes to fronting, have not really been uh, arguing that this is a related party transactions, while others have been treating it as a related party transaction and thus have uh, applied more governance on it than they otherwise would. Um, basically, uh, questions on how you do your reserving okay. and uh, accounting, what's the accounting standard use? That is the, um, actually, the tax authority asked them f for that, you know, so, we have to provide all those different documentation, including auditor certifications and things like that. Great. Um, if we could open up to the floor with some of the polling questions. So I think we'd sort of pick up sort of the first one around where do you think the substance requirements for captives will eventually land? Um, so I think you're going to see um, the fact that whilst outsourcing is going to be permitted, certain functions, the outsourcing of those functions are going to become a lot harder. Um, so the, the OECD in looking at insurance has always maintained sort of what they term as a key entrepreneurial risk-taking function, um, which means which is the main profit generating function of the group for an insurance group, has, their maintenance around that has always been that it is the assumption of underwriting risk. So um, the, the assumption of, of insurance risk, the underwriting function. So it said that's the key entrepreneurial risk-taking function. The curt function for insurance is the underwriting function. To the extent that the OECD wants to see there being substance in a captive, the where they're going to require substance is in the context of the underwriting function. So where we're likely to end up is that there needs to be a, an individual at the minimum who is able to manage that underwriting function. Okay? Now, what does that mean? It's going to be different for every type of captive. Okay? So for the large multinational oil groups where they're writing hundreds of millions of dollars of premiums in the captive, it's going to be very different to a small captive that is insuring the risks of a group in two or three different jurisdictions. Okay? So what you need for the underwriting function to manage that is going to be different to what you need for the underwriting function 
um, of those two different scales. So that's why there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. But there's going to be something in there around underwriting functions. So what, but what does that mean? What's an underwriting function? What do you tend to see in an underwriting function? You tend to see a number of things. So you see something around underwriting policies and guidelines. Okay? Now, those can be very much a risk management oversight type part of the underwriting function. So having that set by the board and reviewed annually by the board is appropriate. Okay? Risk selection and classification. So deciding what risks you're going to underwrite and sort of classifying them, that's far more active. Okay? That's far more of a decision-making function that you're going to want to see in the captive. Okay? Pricing. Pricing actually is something you could potentially outsource. Okay? You need to understand pricing. You need to understand why there's, why there's sort of what, what the price is and how it's been calculated, et cetera. But the calculations of that pricing and doing some of that pricing, that can be done by somebody else. You don't necessarily need to have an actuarial function that's pricing this. You can outsource it. People outsource that. Commercial insurers outsource that. Okay? Um, then you get down to some of the things around actually acceptance of risk, so signing a contract. You're going to have to sign a contract anyway locally. Okay? You, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a require, it's a regulatory requirement. So actually, when you look at it, what you really need to have in your underwriting function and how many people you need to have, you may not need that many. It just, what you need is to have, you need to have certain functionality that is able and experienced enough to manage that. So, for example, you can't just get a office manager who's got no insurance expertise to sit in an office and say, that's my function. Okay? You could get Mr. Substance, as Richard referred to earlier, and I love that sort of uh, term, that you could get Mr. Substance, or let's Mrs. Substance, um, and get Mr. or Mrs. Substance to, uh, fr from your captive uh, manager and actually have them working for you. Or you could get the independent sort of senior individual who's been working for a number of years in the captive space who decides that they don't want to work for Willis or Aon or whoever else and sets up shop in a, in a nice sunny jurisdiction uh, to potentially come and work for you. So there might be a whole new uh, employment opportunity for certain people in this room. So uh, look, there are, these, there are all of these different options to think about, but we're going to have to see something. I think it also will depend on uh, how it is implemented um, throughout the jurisdictions themselves, right? I mean, uh, we, we see some jurisdictions already trying to be ahead of the curve and start to prescribe things, while others are still kind of waiting to see what actually people will expect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. How many captives are at risk from BEPS scrutiny? Look, um, so the UK introduced a measure called diverted profits tax, okay? DPT. DPT is not part of the OEC BEPS project, but was actually introduced to, um, to kind of accelerate the, the UK's response. So, and it was designed to, if, although the tax authorities and, and Treasury won't say it, the, it was designed to have a very narrow application uh, to a particular industry from a particular country. Okay? But the tax authorities looked at it and said, ah, I can apply this to a number of things, including captives. Okay? So, um, there are some large UK PLCs that have large captives. And they've had quite some significant conversations around with, the, with HMRC around DPT. We've also, however, seen some UK PLCs who definitely are not in that sort of significantly large, sort of that, that FTSE 30, the top 30 largest companies in the UK. We're talking top 350 and the sort of the 300 to 350 level. 
We've seen them been challenged by HMRC on their captive. Okay? So I think sort of where what we're going to see is we're going to see an approach around ta from tax authorities around risk assessment. They're clearly going to go after sort of arrangements where they view there to be the biggest price. Okay? But they're also going to go after arrangements where they think there's low hanging fruit. Okay? So you may you are going to see some large captives getting challenged. And we've already seen that. Are we also going to see some of the smaller captives that have been set up being challenged? You see that in the US. Um, there's, so there's something called the 831B um, election. It, it, it's a technical piece of US tax code that enables you to shelter certain level of profits in a Low, in a small insurance company. It's been used as a tax shelter, as a product. The US hate it, the IRS hate it. There's a whole campaign against these captives. The amount at stake from each one is not significant. But when you add it up across the entire taxpayer base, it starts becoming significant. So we may see that, and may see that approach from other tax authorities where they say, look, the amount of tax at stake for each particular captive is not significant, but if we add up across the whole um, industry, there is enough there for us to go after, and they'll go after it through a very consistent, methodical approach that they roll out to each and every captive. Yeah, I think um, when, we, when we look at that, I think it will be, I mean, when we're honest, the OECD BEPS initiative basically is the larger countries trying to claw back and find additional tax base, and the smaller countries um, that kind of sign up to this uh, think like, well, maybe it will be beneficial and I get some tax as well. But honestly speaking, it will be the larger ones that go after the big ones and anything and everything that they think is reasonable and easy for them to do and the rest probably will not see too much. There yeah. will be some changes, there will be some impact, but overall it will be not something where they get extremely challenged. They, certain ones will need to change, but once they've changed into a more reasonable structure, they will be relatively left alone, I would say. Um, so there's a, there's a question that's just popped up at the bottom. Um, the, 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 the captive writing unrelated third-party risk. So, um, look, it depends, okay? So, uh, there'll be some people here who've heard of Avra Avrahami, okay? So, Avrahami is a, ta a case in the US where they found that this was risk engineering, okay? So, commercially, whilst there was some writing unrelated third-party risk, the actual risk exposure was so minimal and it was purely designed for tax purposes that they struck it out. Then there's a case called reverse, uh, reserve mechanical where it's not quite as blatant and it's not quite as bad, but that still was struck out. But there have been other situations where it's been accepted. So, I think the point there is actually, it goes back to the substance question. It goes back to the question again around, um, do you understand what risk you're writing? Okay? So like, if you want to write third party risks, you need to understand what you're signing yourself up for. Okay? And it also goes back to the earlier comment around captive failures captive failures, some of them were driven by people writing third-party risk simply so they could get the tax benefits associated with captives. You've got to be very careful about writing third-party risks. Okay? And then the point is around if you then lay it off in the market, again, it's around retaining sufficient risk so that it just does not look like a conduit. Okay? So you have to retain that risk. If you're retaining that risk, that changes the nature of the captive. It starts becoming more of a commercial insurance company. Do you have the substance and properly manage that? Do you understand what you're doing? 
Yeah, I think it, it's also a, an interesting point because when when you went through the um, the, the the paper pieces, um, there is a drive for that whole commercial aspect to the captive, and um, in certain cases, it creates a little bit of a paradox between, uh, on one hand, saying, well. Um, yeah, we want you to understand what you're doing. On the other hand, please go and write third-party risk. And at the same time, well, um, can you create diversification if you write only the group's risk? But actually, yeah, you um, if you write certain types of risks which are not in the commercial market, then you're also not doing the right thing. So it, it, the whole certain, the, the, a lot of ideas come together and they're kind of a little bit... Um, yeah, kind of opposite to each other because essentially a captive is in part a a vehicle to write risk that you cannot otherwise put into the market. And the reason why the market doesn't take it is often because the market itself is afraid because they don't have enough data. But the company itself has more data than anybody else. So if they don't understand the risk, then nobody does. <laughs> I think what is, if we um, move on, there's a, there's a question around sort of, does your underwriter have to be directly employed by captive, or can one cover a number of captives? So I don't know whether that's somebody who's seeking a new career, um, but like... It is, I, I'm sure. <laughs> I, mean, I, I guess the, the, the point here comes, comes to the sort of, look, um, the... The underwriting function, again, is something you're not going, you, you want an employee, okay? Whether that employee is someone who's full-time or part-time, it's an employee, it's not a contractor, okay? Mm -hmm. You then get into a situation where do you want that employee who is an employee of your group, who understands all the risks in your group, going and also spending 50% of their time working for one of your competitors. Okay. <laughs> That's <Cool>. a good question. <laughs> Anybody want to answer that? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the, the question was saying, look, if the other captive companies from a totally different industry, look, potentially, there's no, like I said, there's no rule set in stone. It's a commercial decision that every group is going to need to do and to make for themselves. And potentially, you may get in a scenario where actually it is feasible and it makes sense to have a part-time employee, and that part-time employee is a sensible individual who's able to work for more than one group. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you are able to have certain, you, you can discuss with that individual about which other companies they work for. Okay? We don't know yet what the, what the, what the report is going to say when it's final. We don't know how different people are going to interpret this. We also don't know what the regulator is going to say. You yeah. may have the regulator in jurisdiction. So we may see um, MAS in Singapore, for example, we may see the Lab 1 FSA, we may see Bank Nagara, we may see the BMA, et cetera, actually require a certain level of substance. And that may actually be over and above what's required from a tax perspective. We just don't know. This is a developing field. Yeah, actually, there, there's been discussions in um, some domiciles as to, well, so if you have somebody who does not spend 100% of their time um, for this captive, so it's not something where they have to spend 100% uh, of their time. Would they be allowed to do something else? Would they be allowed to work for another company in part time? And in some cases, it has been people have been saying no. Yeah. Um, so there's a question around captive manager um, providing additional facilities. So Annie, I'm going to let you answer that one. So. It's, Asking, so you, you, you mentioned earlier that you were able to provide office facilities and, that, and people have taken you up on that. So maybe you talk a little bit more about why you're doing it. Um, it's basically um, depends on the domicile where they come from. So what sort of, uh, what's the definition of substance in their site? 
So some of them is just office and staff. So what we do is we provide them with the staff. It's basically their employee, but our staff, so bad sharing of staff. Okay. So it, that at the moment is acceptable by that domicile. Okay. Yeah. Great, thanks for that. Um, there's a question around reverse VAT, not compensate for profit shifting. Uh, look, they're, they're, they're two different things. So VAT is a tax on turnover. It's a tax on revenue. Okay. Um, profits are profits. A reverse, char a reverse charge doesn't necessarily deal with that. Um, and then the, the other issue around that as well is that not every jurisdiction actually subjects insurance to um, VAT. So if you think about it, um, most European jurisdictions, VAT is exempt. Um, it's only in some of the other markets where there's actually VAT that's charged. So I, 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 that's not going to quite... So. So, it, so the question there was sort of around sort of, look, um, if, if there's a concern around captives and there's a concern around what do you do, how do you sort of, how should you effectively tax them um, because of profit shifting, can you just effectively tax, put the shifting back. yeah, put it shifting back so you avoid it. So look, the US has done that with the beat, okay? So I don't know how much people have heard of the beat, but that's for insurance companies, but it's also for anybody. So if you're a US taxpayer, and you pay too much, too many expenses out of your US group to an affiliate, so a, a, a related party that's based offshore, it does not matter sort of where they are, whether in a high tax, low tax jurisdiction, you are subject to what they call a minimum tax. Okay, the base, the, like, the base, um, a bit, so the beat, it's um, base erosion and, anti-abuse tax, um, and it's designed to stop people from doing that, okay? So the tax authorities are thinking about that. UK DPT does that, Australian DPT does that. We are gonna see that come in more and more, that we're gonna see tax authorities set, essentially set up mechanisms that prevent people from paying, well, from making payments to related parties offshore, okay? Well, you don't need any substance because well, you, whether you have substance or not, it doesn't matter. They're just stopping you from doing it. Yeah. So that 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 we're seeing um, is gonna well, it's gonna be interesting to ha see how that plays out because groups are in like today's today's group are, today's groups are in, inherently multinational. Okay. Like, so most lot of lot of groups are multinational. They have operations in more one jurisdiction. So these types of protectionist measures are becoming difficult for groups to, to deal with. And as more and more jurisdictions put them in place, you're going to see some significant pushback from MNCs. We're already seeing that. Um, OK. Do you believe that the changes result in a level playing field across all captive domiciles? OK, so we've got a, a question around sort of captive domiciles. Um, I know we've got a session tomorrow around um, thinking about domicile choice. Um, I, I think that sort of here you're going to see, you're not necessarily going to see a level playing field as a result of tax changes. Okay? There's so many other things that go into the choice of a captive domicile that it's not just tax. So that's my view from the tax perspective, saying, hey, tax shouldn't be a driver for the choice of do domicile. Yeah. Um, Guys, I don't know what, what you've seen in practice when you're having conversations with clients. It's one of them, but <laughs> not all of them. Okay. Sure. Um, from my perspective, I think it's, yeah, it's never going to be a purely level playing field, uh, especially when you, when you consider tax. Um, I think it will be just the result of this will be that uh, some countries will gravitate to some domiciles more than others because, again, uh, it just makes more sense depending on their, uh, on their footprint and what they see and how their own tax rules actually work. Uh, again, uh, if we take Japan, um, you will see 
certain countries that make more sense to Japanese companies in terms of captives, while others don't. Yeah. So um, we'll take one final question. So the, the last question's in. Um, I'm just going to talk about PCCs, because um, I know we've got a session around PCCs. So um, for those who, who aren't aware, P PCC is protected cell company. You have a core, and then you have a number of individual cells. So you, the, the core can be run and is run in certain places. You've got a core that's been set up by a captive manager. So Willis, Aon, et cetera, they've got their core. And then they've got cells that they provide to their clients, which run as a sort of mini captives. I think the, the issue with that is jurisdictions and a number of jurisdictions are viewing each cell as a separate company. Okay? So whilst in legal form, the PCC is the company and a corporate entity, and the cell WISA has segregated liability, which is the benefit of the PCC, the, because it has that segregated liability, the, uh, the, sort of the parent company of domicile or the other side to the, to the transaction is viewing that cell as, it's, as if it's its own separate legal entity. Okay? So then you then start saying, actually, does that cell of the PCC then needs certain functionality. And again, there's a question of what does that mean and can it rely on the core and is that effectively a form of outsourcing or does it have to have its own independent underwriter, risk manager, whatever you want to call it. And it gets pretty complex in sort of some of those, those discussions. So I don't necessarily see it being a panacea for, for captives and meaning that you don't need to have substance because you can rely on the core, but I don't necessarily see it being sort of, no, it doesn't work anymore. I think you're gonna, it's, again, it's one of those where we're gonna have to wait to see how this develops. Clearly, what the concept of substance means in the, in the context of a PCC type arrangement is gonna form the basis of some of the representations that people make. Yeah, so, the, so the, the point there was that saying that sort of look, in certain circumstances you, have a, you actually have a rated core. So we, we, well from a rating agent's perspective, you look at the unit as a whole, so you don't look at it separately. And then you, the cells are able to benefit from the rating of the overall PCC. And would that help? Again, that comes down to the question around, do you look at this from a tax perspective? What do you look at? Do you look at the cell? Would you look at the entire vehicle? And that's where the direction of travel from tax authorities is to look at it as a cell because of some of the avoidance that people have been doing before in the past. Yeah, also I think it's, it's a situation where tax authorities will use the tactic of, um, you know, kind of uh, disallowing the transaction, kind of using that whole changing the the uh, the matter rather than to have the discussion about the, the five versus three percent, but rather saying, oh, you know what? Actually, the whole thing is uh, just one one avoidance scheme, and substance doesn't matter because, yeah, it's just, you know, it it doesn't work. Okay, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, join me a round of applause for the members of the panel and the moderator.